so focused i'm french the bro host and we would like to welcome you to the next take podcast the next take the next take podcast this is episode 39 and this is a weekly podcast where we cover the most intriguing Knicks news of the week if you want to find us on our socials you can find us on twitter at the Knicks take then go to YouTube and search Nick's Take Videos. And if you rather follow on Instagram, you'll be, you'll be able to find us at the Nick's Take. I don't know what's going on. And, <laughs> and last, you can check us out on Facebook at Nick's Take Media. Now, French, before we get started into everything, how are you doing, sir? It's been a long week, long work week. We did end it off nicely by... Going to the to the Miami Heat next game. Last minute. It wasn't even supposed to be me getting you going. It was supposed to be you and mommy, but I ended up getting that ticket in the last minute. And I, 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 as much as I've been, you know what I'm saying, down on the Knicks, still get the little jitters and excitement the day of you going to the game. Yeah. Even though I didn't know that, I, I mean, not that, no, I pretty much knew that we were going to beat Miami. I'm glad I went. What about you? How was your week? It was interesting because I feel like I thought, I tried to think about what I did this week and I c couldn't really think about it. Like, I remember watching All-Star Weekend, which we didn't cover. You know, we, we did a preview of the slam dunk contest, but mm -hmm. we didn't really cover it. I, I watched the three-point contest, slam dunk contest. I didn't watch the All-Star game. I just completely skipped that. And outside of that, I really can't remember much of what I did this week. I feel like I, I must have been running around, but I don't know. My brain cells are just not working for me today. The outside of that, though, I've been, I've been good. You know, I've been chilling. The All-Star weekend was kind of a snooze fest for the most part. Obi did end up, you know what I'm saying, showing out for the Knicks on that weekend. But outside of the OB in the slam dunk contest, we didn't really get much to talk about. You know, the three point contest. It was it was cool. Carl Towns the rookie sophomore game. I didn't even watch that. Um I watched it. How was that? Was that a good game? So it, it was different. It, you wouldn't know unless you were like trying to pay attention, but they did a, a bunch of new stuff this year with, they did like different teams. Mm -hmm. So for the rookie sophomore, I, I, that was actually kind of throughout the whole weekend, like, except for, I don't know about all-star game, but throughout the whole weekend, they did like teams, like they did the skills contest. There was teams yeah, uh, I saw that. for the rookie, for the rookie, rookie sophomore. It was the same thing. It was teams where four different legends chose who and drafted who they wanted on their teams and all four of those teams competed against each other in tournament style i thought gary payne's team was going to go the distance but it ended up being he ended up facing against the eventual champion rick barry who it looked like i don't i don't know if i really want to say this but like there were three black legends and one white legend, and the one white legend had his team practice, <laughs> had his team practicing all day, going into the into the rookie sophomore games, and then they ended up winning the championship. But that that does that doesn't tell the whole story. I feel like all four of these teams were kind of equal. There was no blowouts. There was no like this team is easily better than this team. They all kind of were chosen based on whatever the legend who drafted, like, you could see what they were going for. And Rick Barry's team was more so going with height and skill. I thought Gary Payton's team was going to win. Gary Payton's team had, I felt, like had the best lineup out of all of the teams. 
but he ended up facing Rick Barry's team and they ended up losing. I, I wish I could remember exactly like every single lineup, but I do remember the Bones Highland was on Gary Payton's team. And um, there were a few other guys I, that I can't really think of. Oh, Scotty Barnes was on that team. I was he like, yo, he's got up the whole weekend. No, I ain't going to love him. He wasn't sticking it up for that game, though. But it it was it it was just like so many guys where it's like, yo, you got this dude, this dude, and this dude. You got you got you got killers on your team. You got to win. And it just ended up they ended up not you know taking it to taking it to the finish line in the end. It was really close. It came down to like the last whoever made the last shot was going to win the game, and they ended up not making the last shot. I'm gonna actually look it up because I I want you to hear. I want you to hear the lineups because you didn't actually watch it. I was hoping you would be able to help me out a little bit. Yeah, I, I, I didn't get a little excited for that one at all because, I don't know, I'm just a Nick right. homer. I wanted to see the, the, the events that the Knicks are a part of, and if there isn't any, I'm just not interested. All right, so I got the lineups right here. We had Isaiah Thomas. He drafted Precious Achua, Desmond Bain, Sadiq Bey, Anthony Edwards, Tyrese Halliburton, Jaden Hardy from the G League Ignite, and Isaiah Stewart. He faced off against Team Worthy, who had Cole Anthony, Marjan Beauchamp from the G League Ignite, Josh Giddy, Jalen Green, Herbert Jones, Tyrese Maxey, Jalen Suggs. I was like, that's a pretty good matchup. Isaiah won that one with Precious, Desmond Bain, Sadiq Bey. Anthony Edwards, Tyrese Halliburton, Isaiah Stewart. Team Barry had Cade Cunningham, Dyson Daniels from the G League Ignite, Evan Mobley, Isaac Okoro, Alperin Shingun, Jay Sean Tate, Franz Wagner. Not the most sexy names. Like, Cade, is, Cade was the number one overall pick. Evan Mobley, big man. Alperin Shingun, big man. Franz Wagner, big man. Like, you got Isaac Okoro, who, you know, he's good, but, like, they, they, these aren't the sexiest names that you're going to hear. Gary Payton's team, LaMelo Ball, Scotty Barnes, Ayo Dosunmu, Chris Duarte, Scoot Henderson from the G League Ignite, Jaden McDaniels, Davion Mitchell, and Jonathan Kamingo, who was injured. He, he, was, he was replaced by a Chris Duarte. Now, if you hear if you hear that lineup, <laughs> out of all these lineups, which one did you like? Do you think was the best one? The love. That one, right? Yeah. They lost in the first round against Team Barry, and then Team Barry beat Team Isaiah, and, and won won the championship. And you yeah. know, it it was very fun. I thought it was pretty good. I just did it. You know, I felt like maybe Team Barry should have just took the L. You know, considering it's February, but that's just me. I don't know. The fact that it was in Cleveland, I don't know. It kind of took the life out the All Star game. Well, not the All Star game, the All Star weekend, because a lot of people didn't even look happy to be there. A lot of the players, they move it smooth. I guess they do that every year, but I don't know. Every I, year. It, it, it just didn't have any life in any of the events that I was watching. The three point contest was cool, but it wasn't amazing, except for like, when Carl Towns went crazy for that one round. But that's how it goes every year. Every year, somebody goes crazy for a round. There's never a year in the three-point contest where somebody, where, where everybody just thinks it up. There's always somebody who just like, oh, they're about to go for 30 or, or 35. For real. But, um, but the last thing I heard, I I, I disagreed because I feel like Multiple years in a row, I've seen Curry versus Clay, Curry versus somebody else who's just going crazy from three for one round, and Curry just goes and tops them. Maybe because without the three-point contest, I mean, without Curry being in three-point contest, it doesn't get as crazy, but I don't know. It didn't seem like there was much of an opponent for Towns after he had that one amazing round, but. We could just go ahead and get to the dunk contest because that's the one event that I, every Knicks fan was probably watching. 
for sure, since we have representation, New York representation, more than once. Absolutely. So, slam dunk contest. We had Ovi Toppin facing off against Juan Toscano Anderson, Cole Anthony, and Jalen Green. And my first, my first thoughts on this. Cole Anthony went up, pulled out some Tims. Everybody's like, oh, is he about to dunk, do some crazy dunk with some Tims on? Oh, okay. All right. And he completely whiffed on like all of his attempts until he finally made it. And it just, I was just like, yo, you are so not close to dunking this ball that it doesn't, it looked like you weren't even practicing. Like you just was like, oh, I'm just going to dunk in some Tims. Like it's something that you just normally do. Uh, you wasn't even going to really see if it might be an issue to do whatever it is you're trying to do. Well, before Cole talked kind about of, him dunking in Tims, I was mad at the fact that he put a Knicks jersey on and then did that. <laughs> he got a New York Knicks jersey. I mean, I figured he jersey. would. And then he throws Tim's on to show, like, oh, I'm New York. I want to come to the Knicks. I feel like, like, cool. You do all that. And then you not even getting close on these dunks. It took him, like, 10 tries to get that one dunk in. And it wasn't even that crazy when he did it. Yeah, that's a whole fact. It, it definitely didn't look great when he did it. And then we had Jalen Green trying to put everybody to sleep, trying to do the same dunk 500 million times off the side of their backboard, trying to do a dunk that we've already seen, just put a little extra spin to it. After like the fourth, fifth time, you would think, all right, obviously either the pass is not good enough for me to do this dunk or I'm not good enough to do this dunk. Let me move on to something else. But because... I think they need to just change the rule because they only have attempts counted as if you actually catch the ball and hit the rim but it needs to be at least some type of peanut way to penalize guys who not even catching a ball and like you can't reward people to get extra tries because they're getting they're, they're nowhere near close you get what i'm saying i get like, what you're saying but let's 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 apply that rule to what we actually saw in this slam dunk contest if they did that <laughs> It would be a real short night, first of all. And Obi Toppin would win the dunk contest by just oh. making his dunks. <laughs> he he could have just did a two-handed dunk and won. Well, actually, not to, like, not to bury the lead, but that's actually how he, like, he could have actually done a two-handed dunk against Juan Toscano Anderson, who he met in the finals. All he had to do was a two-handed dunk, and he would have won because he had enough points in the first in the first of the two rounds in the finals. He was already beating him. Juan Toscano couldn't complete his dunk in the three tries that he had. Obi could have just did a regular old dunk. He could have missed all his dunks in one. So I figured, like, that's his version of a two-handed dunk. All the dunks that he was doing, the between the legs off the backboard. I'm like, dog, he's making it look like a layup. If he would have threw them, threw all them dunks down with force, he would have got 50s. But because he was that making it dunk. look so easy. That one dunk he made, he know he wish he would have missed it. Because if he would have made that dunk, he, he would have made that dunk with force, it would have been 50. But because it was kind of like a lay in, and he they they gave him what, 46, 45, 44, something like that. Yeah. That was a that, he had he had he definitely should have won. He had the best dunks of the night. That he, you know. I don't know if everybody would have made their dunks. We would be saying that it would have been probably a little closer, but of all the made dunks, he had the best ones. Like there was nobody who had even come, came close to that. And I, I think another thing that made this dunk contest a snooze fest was the commentators. Like they were clearly biased. D Wade and had a rooting interest, and Kenny Smith had a rooting interest. It's just like, bro. They didn't that, want to give Obi any credit for the dunks that he made. But I, I understand it because they know that if Obi Toppin would have been in any of these other dunk contests, he would have lost in the first round in the first in the first round in the first seating. Because he would have. He, think, not any of the not any of the others. There have been there have been other bad dunk contests like this one, because this was a bad one. But there were some dunk contests where 
you know, unless we go back as far as when Kenny the Kenny <laughs> when Kenny was dunking in the dunk contest, because that was a very bad one too. Mm-mm. If he'd have done dunk in the dunk contest, he would have won easily. You wouldn't know but I disagree. Why? Because every single dunk he did was a dunk we've never seen before, and the reason why. When you look back at it now, when you say if you put those same dunks in any other dunk contest, like that, like the reason why it was the, what it was is because he had very little competition to even go against. Like I feel like if he was going up against Terrence, Terrence Jones, that's his name, right? Damn, you might be talking about Derek Jones Jr. Yeah, Derek Jones. If he was going against someone like a Derek Jones and an Eric Gordon, like. He would have been feeling some pressure to go crazy and add a little something extra to the dunks that he already did because he's feeling like, oh, I could I, I could potentially lose to this person here. And that that I think that's what helps the dunk contest. When you going against guys who are taking 10 attempts on a dunk to start the slam dunk contest, it's like you ain't really gotta get too 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 amped up and animated to win a dunk contest. He he just basically did a layup I, and, and 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 came home with the crown. I agree with you in a sense, but in another sense, like in the first dunks, he, he was he wasn't perfect with his first dunk. Like if he came out and just automatically knocked down his first dunk easy, I would agree with you. But he whiffed on his first dunk too. Backboard dunk. The I think his first dunk was when he jumped over, when he jumped over homeboy behind his back, behind the back. Like he that was he almost injured himself doing that first dunk. He fell into the crowd and all that stuff. If he did that, if he would have did the second try, his first try, then I might be able to give you a little bit of bail. But he he was whiffing from jump. Everybody was whiffing from jump. It was overall just not great. And there was no dunk that was completed so easily on the first try, except after Obi missed a bunch of his tries again and had to switch before he <laughs> before he would have lost. And, and that dunk was a pretty good one. But that was the one dunk that he did that we have seen before. It wasn't something that was brand new. He missed doing a dunk that we've never seen before. And I agree with you that if some of these other guys were like showing competition and like Jalen Green is a good dunker. Jalen Green was it, it was everybody's favorite, I think, going into this. It, and for the reasons that I said in the last podcast, because he's a small, he's not a big man, big man dunkers. It's very hard for them to win dink dunk contests. He can get up there. He, he has a lot of the fluidity and all that stuff. But I just felt like all of these guys, him, Cole Anthony, Juan Toscano Anderson, I feel like they didn't put an, any kind of real importance on winning this. I felt like Obi Toppin looked like the only dude who was really felt like it was important. Everybody was just more so about the showboating and the finale, but not actually completing the dunk. Obi Toppin looked like the only one who belonged in the dunk contest. It, yeah. I think Jalen I think Jalen Green does belong in the dunk contest, but he needs to take it seriously. And I felt like Cole Anthony one hundred percent did not take it seriously. He he looked like he came out there and, and was like, Oh yeah, I'm just gonna dunk in some Tims and I'm gonna get a fifty. And it's like, yo, how many times did you actually practice this dunk? Because the first ten times that you tried to do this dunk, you weren't nowhere close. You weren't touching rim, nothing. And you you were oh 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 like you hear oh, oh. like yo bro you're not you're not able to do this dunk like you obviously didn't practice it until he actually did do a version of the dunk and he made it a little bit easier on himself but yeah. there was clearly no practice involved and you can't you, when when you see that and then you have Jalen Green doing the same dunk five hundred million times all the dunkers are getting cold now it's, it was just overall bad. Yeah. Obi, I think, performed well, but if if we put we're not we can't put him in the top half of best dunkers in the slam dunk contest. Like we we have slam dunk contest losers that had better performances than Obi Toppin. So that that's not great. And 
Yeah. Hey, like I said before, he could have won this dunk contest, finishing it off. He could have done both his rounds with two handed dunks, like, and he would have won. And that's how bad it was. But, but outside of that, I thought he performed well, but I just, everything surrounding it, yeah, I didn't like that. Yeah, but enough for the All Star weekend. I want to get back to just the Knicks because there was some new. I mean, Obi's Nick. Since, well, Obi won the dunk contest. We already got into that. <laughs> Since then, the next next news that we received was after the All Star Weekend when we were preparing to get back into the rigors of the NBA season. We got a report from Woe stating that New York Knicks point guard Kemba Walker is going to be sidelined for the remainder of the season. Mainly to just ramp him up for next season and get, I guess. We're going to be receiving more better trade offers and since it's the last year of his contract next year. So this opens up more minutes for quickly in the in the meantime. Hopefully we get to see some more Deuce McBride minutes. And with Derrick Rose coming back, it opens up a slot for him too. So, Except <laughs> right after that, we're leading into the Miami Heat game. It was reported that Derrick Rose will be out due to having a procedure to address a skin infection after his previous surgery. Actually, the way it was originally reported was that he was going to have another surgery. Everybody was like, wait, what? He's going to have another surgery on that? He said he was fine. A a small procedure. But that's what originally, that's how it was put out there. Like, he was going to have another surgery. Like, he was going for a reason. Right. And then as more information came out, it's like, nah, actually, it's just a small procedure. His his ankle's fine. It l- might be a little skin infection or something as a result of the surgery. But, you know, where Tibbs was like, oh, we hope to see him in one to two weeks. He he should be he should be back soon. He should be back before the end of the season. And that sounds a lot better. Yeah. Still, though, I was very much hoping to see Derrick Rose going into the Miami Heat heat game, especially when we were expecting R.J. Barrett to be back. Mm -hmm. And with that, let's talk about that Miami Heat game that me and you both attended. Yeah, R.J. was back for this game. Nerlens Noel was listed as available, but he didn't even come off the bench this game. Jericho Sims was the only big man to play. And before we even get into the game, I was just... Sitting, we got there like what an hour and a half, two hours early. You got there two hours early, and mm-hmm. the energy in the building wasn't as gloomy as it was the day of the Nets game. But it also wasn't super energetic, and you didn't feel like the electricity in the garden that you normally feel. And that's two times in a row that I'm saying that about the garden. And I saw a lot more Miami Heat jerseys than I really was comfortable with. And then I started hearing chants throughout the game. I'm like, yo, what the hell? The garden mm-hmm. is, I don't know. It's something going on this season where the opponents are getting is just as loud as the Knicks fans in the crowd. And that never I was, happens. I was telling you leading into this, as I play a clip <laughs> that everybody can hear, I was telling you leading into this that are you prepared to hear Miami take over the garden? And you was like, wait, what? Why? And yeah, I was I like, was that's that what's going to at that point. You did it. You were like, nah, I don't see that happening. And that's exactly what happened. And that I just played a clip from us being at the Knicks game, the first point scored. But yeah, I was 100% expecting Miami to like if Miami took advantage, took took a lead or anything like that, I was I knew we were gonna hear the Miami chants. And we definitely did. Yeah, it was a my a few Miami people right in our section and I was just just didn't like that shit. But <laughs> outside of that, the game actually had a good pace to it to start. And Julius Randle got off to a good start. From my perspective, a lot of people came at Julius for this game. I didn't really feel like he had that bad of a game. 
I thought he made a lot of great decisions Good. throughout the game, but he does have moments throughout the game where he still does stupid turnovers, takes bad shots, and looks like he's lost on the offensive side of the court. But I felt like a lot of the time he was setting up his teammates really well. He was making sure to be on the rebounds, but Miami just had a, a, a great defensive plan to keep him at bay. <clears throat> um, Quentin Grimes went down pretty early in this game. Like his mm -hmm. very first minutes in the game, he went down with a knee injury that we later found out was a subulex subluxation of the you right. Probably should have practiced. <laughs> you probably should have practiced this word. <laughs> I thought because I was just going to say. I, I was just going to say he dislocated his patella. I wasn't even going to try to say it, but it'll be good on you. Go for the proper medical terms. Subluxation. <laughs> That's what happens when you slow it out. No surgery will be needed. He's going to be out of the lineup for a few weeks before being reevaluated, which was the best news that we could have because just hearing about Derrick Rose going down and then we find out, all right, it's not that bad. But then him going down with a knee injury, Quentin Grimes being the brightest, one of the brightest spots of this next season so far, that pretty much is another punch in the gut that we didn't really need. So the fact that he's only going to be out for a few weeks is very encouraging. Another encouraging sign, RJ. Had mm. 30 points in the first half and didn't really get much help from his teammates outside of that because the Knicks were still down 55-65. And in the second half, he just started picking up where he left off. He ended up with a new career high in points halfway through the third quarter. And... After having the first half of his career, his life, Miami's defense was just not letting anyone else get comfortable. Evan Fournier was knocking down a few threes, and then outside of that, we didn't really have much going. Obi Toppin didn't really get much going in this game. He finished the game with three points going one for three from the field. Cam Reddish did get to the free throw line. Knocked down two threes, finished the game with eight points, but the starters were the main ones doing all the scoring. We didn't really get much out of the bench. IQ was inconsistent throughout this game. Um, and with Deuce getting a few minutes at the end of this game, he didn't really get much of a chance to get comfortable. Alec Brooks got most of the point guard minutes this game, and RJ finished the game with just, I don't know, like, he was getting to the free throw line and getting most of his points from the free throw line in the second half, more so than getting, like, transition threes, like how he's gotten in the first half. Mm -hmm. He was getting a lot of and ones this game, too. It was really encouraging just to see him overpower Tyler Hero over and over. He was going mm -hmm. through the pick and roll, targeting Tyler Hero and Duncan Robinson, getting Jimmy Butler off him until Tyler Hero and them was on him, and then immediately just attacking him and getting to the paint. You kept calling it out throughout the game. Like, he's seen, he's, he's seen a baby in Tyler Hero. He keep calling him out, and that's what happened. He ended up finished the, finishing the game with 46 points, career high, nine rebounds, and he went 11 for 22 from the field, if I'm not mistaken. 13 for 22 and 6 of 11 for mm -hmm. the field. Mm -hmm. 14 Ran 22 through. from the free throw line. 14 <laughs> from 22. If he would have just knocked down more of his free throws, he would have easily got the 50 piece. Easily. Mm -hmm. He went to the free throw line a couple times and just let with the, all you hear is a, a sigh from the crowd anytime he misses a free throw because we just understand if he just knocks that down more consistently, Think he about how much his throws. scoring average would go up. Think he missed how much eight his free throws. He was go up. I'm just saying, he had eight free throws. He was four points away from fifty. Do you you make half of those missed free throws, you get to fifty, and you make all of them. The Knicks are a lot closer in this game than they end up being. I'm not saying that they win, but this was what a 15 point victory. Yeah, it was a 15 point victory. You missed eight shots. 
at the end, you actually have something to play for as opposed to you already know you're out of it and you stop trying, which is pretty much what ended up happening. Yeah, what was your the takeaways all the, from this game? You said that you didn't feel like Julius played a bad game. Yeah, he finished nearly with a triple-double. He finished with what? 13, no, 11 points, 8 rebounds, and 8 assists. Went 2 for 15 from the field. I understand that's not great. But Miami, he <laughs> was making it hard on him. I'm not going to lie. He did have a lot of open shots that he just didn't make. He, he went 0 for 4 from 3. Cool. He's not going to have a game like this all the time because when R.J. Barrett has shooting nights like this, when nobody has a word to say, I'm not going to do it to Julius Randle because he did look like he his head was in the game. He was trying to make the right plays, and he just, in the fourth quarter, I can't defend anything he did because he definitely threw the game away in the fourth quarter. But outside of that, I had I I enjoyed watching him play because he was playing hard. He was moving hard in transition, pushing the pace, doing the same things that he he was doing before the All Star break. And it seems like he had his mind on not getting. Remember what I said to you before the game. Thing to watch for tonight, Julius Randle after the All Star game, because historically speaking, he's been really bad since All Star, like the game right after the All Star break. I was actually going to bring that up. I felt like when he started this game, he was the first one to not get a basket to start the game. And then he was setting up his teammates. He was setting RJ up for a lot of those open threes. Like, I don't want to just ignore that because he had a bad shooting. And and in the fourth quarter, yeah, it's not great that your best player is turning the ball over like that. But we can't blame him for being our best player. That's my opinion. Maybe I'm just turning a new leaf on Julius Randle, but I just didn't feel like he was French. unredeemable after that game. <clears throat> French, you should go to beauty school. Beauty. Because you damn sure know how to put lipstick on a pig and make it look good. That was not a good game from Julius Randle. I will give you, I will give you yeah, you said he shot two for 15, which is not great. <laughs> it's not great. No, French, it's not great. It's it's bad. <laughs> it's objectively awful. Two for 15? That is less, that is less than 20% shooting. So, yeah, you're right. It's not great. <laughs> he also had Four turnovers. He, I think he had three turnovers back to back in the fourth quarter. He, you, he, you already said he missed all of his shots from three. Your best player, you just called him your best player. He had the second least points out of the starting unit, 11. And the only reason he had the second least points is because Mitchell Robinson did absolutely nothing on offense. Maybe we have to watch out for him after all star break. Maybe he needs to keep him he's a good yeah. matchup for Mitch. no 100 percent. i don't want to i don't want to shoot bail for mitch though bam is bam is a good matchup for him but Small, he only stronger. took what he only took one shot attempt i understand a lot of that is because he had five personal fouls but he played 30 minutes in this game and he didn't foul out so Mitch needs to get more than one shot attempt. And he had the one shot attempt he had, it was easy. Like he shouldn't have missed it. And he did. And he made no dunk attempts. Nothing like it was just a bad night for Mitch, even though he had nine rebounds. Yeah. Julius Randle had 11. He only played 35 minutes, which a lot of people have been asking for. Like he's playing too many minutes and he's looking tired at the end of the game. We can't blame him being tired at the end of this game. He only played 35. And yet his fourth quarter was horrendous. Alec Burks had 12 and Evan Fournier had 13. I would say Evan Fournier had a bad game as well. He picked it up in the second half. It's what got him. I, I even posted if he doesn't play, if he doesn't play well in this third half, if he can't hit his shots in the third half, in the third quarter, excuse me, 
he doesn't deserve to play in fourth. He hit a couple of his shots in the third quarter. He got to play in the fourth. But if he would have played in the fourth and not hit no shots in the third, I would have been beside myself. Then who but once again, four? nobody else had a hot hand. Nobody on that bench was providing offense. Nobody on the bench was providing any type of spark. Yes, but the problem is I, I have no problem with putting somebody. I have no problem with putting Evan Fournier on the bench if you're replacing him with somebody who can play defense. And you got guys on that bench that can play defense. Because he wasn't playing defense in the first half. In the second half, he stepped it up on both sides. He stepped it off offensively and defensively. He deserved yeah, to play yeah. in the second half. But in that first half, I was like, yo, this dude is blowing coverages. He's he's letting guys get past them. He's letting dudes get to the rim. And he still did that in the third quarter, too. But he's hitting his shots, and then he tightened up his defense a little bit after that. But that's how bad he was playing in the first half. Like, I did not want to see Evan Fournier in the second half at all, but I knew he, he's going to come out. He's going to he's gonna come out in the third quarter. He's got to play. And this third quarter is going to determine whether he, needs, whether he should get minutes in the fourth. And he should have got minutes in the fourth. Well, Cam I'm looking played well. Forward to this. No, go ahead. Cam Reddish played well. He was inconsistent, he but was he played well. beat on defense a lot, too. Yes, he was. I would not have placed, replaced Evan Fournier with Cam Reddish. If we're just talking about defense, I would have put quickly out there. If Quentin Grimes didn't get hurt, I'd have had Quentin Grimes out there. We got some... Did we talk about Deuce? Yeah, I said Deuce only got a okay. few minutes, but he didn't get his chance to get his feet wet. I mean, I was surprised to even see him. I wasn't. He was moving. Like you wasn't surprised man. to see Deuce? I was 100% certain that we was only going to see Deuce for the rest of the season in the in the G League, especially when Derrick Rose came back. Now, Derrick Rose was back in this game, but I still was like, mm, we're still probably not going to see Deuce. We're probably going to see Alec Burks in quickly. But after Grimes went down, I felt like it was pretty obvious that he was going to come in. That's why I wasn't really sure. Grimes doesn't play point guard, though. Yeah, but that Deuce is going to be the a better option, at least to help on defense than any other player that you can replace got Grimes with in that moment. And that's why I felt like I, I, I was expecting to see him play a little more minutes because of Grimes going down, but I don't know. Maybe we'll see him tomorrow against Philly. I, but anyway, uh, let's go ahead and get right into predictions, French. So last episode, if you don't remember, do you remember? Because... Ja predicted that the Knicks would be going what? Oh, while well, I predicted the Knicks would be going oh and one. What I remember How did is that, that I said, what I, what I remember is that I told you that I wanted you to go oh and one so that the Knicks might actually have a chance of winning this game because your last few predictions, the, the result was the exact opposite of what you predicted. So that's what I remember. But yeah, that's but right. You... you you predicted correctly, so you get to go first. And in the upcoming games this week, the Knicks will be playing Philadelphia twice, back-to-back -back on the 27th of February, which is tomorrow, probably today if you're listening to this on the day that we release, on ABC. It's not going to be on MSG. It's not going to be on ESPN. It's going to be on ABC at 1 o'clock. Don't be, be, don't be late. Make sure you, you in tune. Then we play them again on the 2nd of March on MSG and ESPN. And then we play Phoenix on the 4th of March, which is Thursday, I believe. And Philly's, uh, the Philly game is on Tuesday. This game will also be on ESPN and MSG. So three straight nationally televised games this week. Three straight. Three. And I got us going one and two. That is a very good prediction, sir. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We got Philly at 1. We got Philly at 7.30. We got Phoenix. Yeah, if I was going first, I would probably say 1 and 2. So now that means I have to choose between us getting completely swept or winning 2. I got us winning the game tomorrow specifically. 
that's exactly the game that I would think that that would be the one game. I would think that we would win the one game at one o'clock at home, especially seeing how they played against Miami. But at the same time, Philly just killed Minnesota and James Harden looked really good. So, yeah, I might have to go. I might have to go. Oh, and three. Yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna have, I, I don't want to. I really don't want to. I really don't want to. I, the problem is that I really don't. Phoenix is don't the see. one team that I just don't see us winning. And it's really hard to win two straight games against the same team, especially with a team as good as Philly. I just. I want to go. Cool. Chris Paul is out for the for the for foreseeable future for it don't um, Phoenix. It so don't I, matter. See, we that could be a dark horse horse win. That could be two and two right there. We got uh, we going to Phoenix. Like it's not even in the garden. Like I, I yeah, no. It's at Phoenix. I if it was at home, then I would I would definitely go two and one. But we're going to Phoenix. Play at their home, it doesn't matter if Chris Paul is not there because they still have a really good team even without him. Yeah, but Chris Paul is what makes them scary, I feel like. And 100%. For, since we don't have a point guard, Chris Paul is the type of player who's going to dissect the our team because of the fact that we don't have a point guard. They don't really have another psychotic player like that on the team. They're, Devin Booker is just going to score and do his thing. DeAndre Ayton's going to do his thing. He, he's going to have to step up more that Chris Paul's out in this time period. But I think Phoenix could be got, but I'm not going to bet on it. So I'm going to stick with my bet. One and two, you got 0 and three. Yeah, I mean, they still have Cam Payne. We got Cam Reddish. They got Cam Johnson. They they got Bridges, they got Aiden, they got Booker. Yeah, man, I, I yeah. Well, actually, can, is campaign out? It looks like campaign is out. He's, it looks like he has a right wrist sprain. Hey, you made your prediction already too, so you can't change it at this point. It's already solidified. It's I wasn't changing it. I okay. th- just to be clear, sure. I wasn't I wasn't changing it. Just but sure. let's see. It's not listed on the injury and play in Thursdays. Yeah, so he must have just played. So I think he's, I think I, he he probably should, yeah, he probably should be good at least by that game. Well, no, he was ruled out of Friday's game against the Pelicans. We'll see. Uh, these teams have a, these teams have a habit of bringing their best players out of injury against the Knicks. You notice that? Like dudes will be hurt, and then all of a sudden they're healthy for the Knicks. Like. I, I, that's why I always like, it doesn't, if it's a team with good players, I always, go, regardless of whether they are in the injury report or not, that team is going to win. If they're, if they're a good team with that player, that team's going to win because they're LeBron James is going to come out. Can't, <laughs> Chris Ball is going to come out. He's going to come out of injury to play against the Knicks like that nationally televised game. Yeah. They're going to play like, that's how it always goes. Like they're ma- magically healthy Yeah, when, when it comes to playing the Knicks. So scare me too, but I feel like they could be God. I forgot to play the clips of Obi Toppin <laughs> when we were talking about this slam dunk contest. Cool. I, I I'm gonna just play them now at the end. So if you guys stuck around this long, hey, if you didn't see these dunks, Obi Toppin had some dunks in the tuck for the slam dunk contest, and I'm about to play them for you right now. Let me just share the tab. Just share the tabith. Yeah, your boy Obadiah. Damn. Go nowhere, go wherever not going anywhere. Yeah, if he'd have done that on the first try, fifty. I mean, if he'd have done this on the first try, people who listening cannot see this. I'm well. Keep that in no. I, well, that's why I'm talking so that the people listening, they they will know that they need to hit us up on the YouTube, subscribe, like, all the good jazz. This dunk that you guys cannot see because you're listening and not watching us on YouTube, 50. All of these dunks, I think, are 50. 
Maybe one of them are not 50. Well, this one, eh, it wasn't 50 live, so. Yeah, I mean. And then I, they have this video at the end of Obi Toppin's little practice round. I have no faith that that dunk actually. <laughs> I have no faith that that actually went in, which is why they strategically cut it off before he finished the dunk. And yeah, so that. Oh, man, that was some of Obi's dunks posted by at TFB Chuck the Boss on Twitter. And then I saw here in the little reply, somebody else posted one. And yeah, these dunks are, well, this one may not be a 50, but he should have done it in the dunk contest because I feel like he could have done that. That's a 50. That he did a windmill arm in the rim jumping over somebody that's a 50 and i feel like he could have done that easily i don't know what that was he probably gonna be I, at the dunk contest again next year to defend the crown i he won it last year he should have won it last year he won it this year but was it was not yeah it, it was not great i yeah i don't know i don't He's a great and amazing dunker, but I, he can be got. Like, he can be got. If you execute all your dunks on the first try, you can get Obi Top in, in the dunk contest. You can be him. But you also have to be creative because he had the most creative dunks in the dunk contest. These dunks that we were just playing, sure. that if you're watching on the YouTube, you would be able to see all of them and not listen to the descriptions on them. Um, these were very creative and a bunch of them were fifties. And if you hit them on the first try, definitely yeah, fifties. yeah, definitely. But anyway, I'm going to jump, you want to jump into recommendations? Cause you stole mine. I don't appreciate that at all. Y you didn't say that you had a recommendation. So I didn't realize I was stealing. Otherwise I wouldn't have, you know, stolen it. You can go first, sir. What was your recommendation? You go first so I got time to think since you thieve in my thoughts. It's cool. Uh, well, I'm going to keep that in mind next time. You never said anything, sir. So I have been watching, much to the chagrin of people who also wanted to watch it, Bel Air, the dramatic retelling of the Fresh Prince of Bel Air. I saw the trailer that somebody made a few years ago. And I was like, that's interesting. It's probably not going to get done, but cool. Will Smith seen the same trailer. It was like, I love it. Found the dude director of the trailer, met with him. He posted all this stuff on, on YouTube and all that stuff. Yeah, it, it's, it, it gets crazy. I feel like right now, it's more so stuck in the character development stages while still trying to tell a story that's enticing and entertaining. But I feel like there's a lot of storylines that happened in the Fresh Prince show that I'm looking forward to seeing in this Bel Air series. So my recommendation for a TV show is I've, I've been trying really hard to get into anime and this last week, I've been watching Afro Samurai. It's on Hulu. It's a show. Well, not really a show. It's it's more of a story told through different parts, but it's laid out like as if it's a it's a series. And if you're not into anime, and you're not into fighting stuff. It's not really something that you're going into looking to, for it to be like incredible, but. I feel like it's a cool story about this little kid whose father was one of the top samurais in the world, number two ranked overall, if I'm not mistaken. And when you're ranked number two, you're always constantly having to face other guys who want your headband and want to be labeled number two as one of the second best assassin in the world. So they came, they had to duel it out right in front of his son and... It's a crazy, it's a crazy show. 
So it, it, it does a really good telling of who Afro Samurai is, what his intentions are, and Samuel Jackson's in the show. So I think y'all should give that a watch before it's uh, off the Hulu network streams. It's supposed to be done soon. As it says, like, in another week or so. So just go and check that out. I see you're back. So I, I just... Did you make your recommendation? I made my recommendation, Afro Samurai. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. You're I, okay, remember. cool. I do remember that one. I started rewatching that this All week. right, French. I, 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 yeah. So I think we should just sign out here. All right, everybody. Once again, we appreciate y'all. Yeah. We love y'all. Thank y'all for listening to the mixtape, 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 that intro music was Broadway Boo by Gotti B, formerly known as Bugatti Blade. You can find us on Twitter at The Knicks Take. You can also find us on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Thank you for listening.